Joining me now, the founder of the Media Action Network, my friend Ken the Court. Ken, there's a lot to unpack with this Kamala stuff, and we'll get into all of it, but let's begin at the beginning. You obviously are a very experienced media guy, your time at Fox News, all that stuff. How does a hit piece on Kamala Harris make its way into the very, very left-wing Washington Post? Shouldn't they be best friends? Well, if you want to learn out, learn out generally where a hit piece came from, read the whole thing and see who it's nice to. And whoever's the, the, the person looking good in that, and whether it's a staffer on, on Biden's team, whether it's somebody else, uh, that's generally the, the, the person that leaked it out to them to begin with. So, uh, look, there's obviously a lot of sniping going back and back and forth, uh, a, a lot of it coming down from, from the president's side. They're in free fall with their numbers. You know, you, you don't blame your boss. You, you, you try to create a little bit of, a, of, a, of some finger pointing to the other, other, other direction. And this other direction is, is her. Okay, now let's focus on her, Ken. I, I, obviously, all jokes aside, and I do enjoy my Kamala jokes, in all seriousness, she's always come off to me, which is very odd for a politician, as being extremely uncomfortable with who she is. Just seems like a very nervous, unsettled person, while at the same time being a wildly ambitious person. And in my opinion, it's just my opinion, that's why everyone around her gets treated like crap. Am I off? Yeah, I think most politicians are probably wildly ambitious who get to that national level. I mean, the uncomfortable part clearly jumps out every time she's asked a a tough question and she cackles and, and looks around. We saw that in the campaign. It was it was odd when when somebody would break into nervous laughter when asked something important. It's like, hey, how about those those dead children in the plane crash? And she she'd start start laughing uncontrollably. Um, so, you know, you certainly have that. And look, she's, she's, she's a mile wide and an inch deep. She is, she is not, it's not like she by hook and crook maneuvered her way into this, into this position. She ran for president. She came, even though she had all of the ethnic female check boxes off, she got so, so dismal that you couldn't even counter in the polls. And the Biden team at one point got themselves into the position where they felt that they had to nominate a woman of color. She was their least offensive choice. I mean, I don't want to act like she's Zelig kind of shooting up there, but I lived in California almost my entire life. And she's had amongst the lowest, I mean, you know, up until she ran for office, had she walked around, even though she'd held five, uh, until she ran for president, even though she'd held major positions, most people wouldn't have recognized her. She, she wasn't a, a major force in California. Ken, okay, now, it, I hate identity politics. Everyone knows this. I think Republicans do this, fall into this trap now, too, and I despise it. How do we target Hispanics? Or how do we target women? I, I, just, I, de I despise it on a visceral level. But I'm also not naive. I understand, for the Democratic Party at least, it has been successful on some level. So that Joe Biden call to have to pick a woman, uh, and a black woman, it all looks ridiculous now because Kamala Harris is, well, terrible. But was it the smart move? Does that actually gain ground? Does it, does it help Joe Biden when he says, I'm picking a black woman? Does it help? Look, the, the Democrats are unified by identity politics more than the Republicans. The Republicans do it out of out of defense of, ah, crap, I think I'm looking like a racist because we don't have enough people of color, black people, whatever, and, and they do things. Uh, you know, you certainly saw them pre-Trump uh, uh, take that to the to the illegal immigration. They just said we're not talking about this because they didn't want to be called called bad words again. Uh, it, but it's a different game at the at, at on the Democratic side. I mean, I mean, look at the makeup of the Democratic primary voters. You know, you, you've got a big chunk of 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 black voters. So if they're what twelve percent in the country, they're they're double that almost in the Democratic Party. So I don't think that she helped him, but she's she prevented him from from getting slammed uh, in the sense that, I mean, look, Kamala Harris doesn't really scream out. I mean, you know, she's a female and some mishmash of of American style mutt of, of her background. Uh, but but I think that he would have had a serious problem with the black constituencies, with the BLM, with all of that that was really riding high right up when he, he made that choice. So it was probably a, a good not net positive, but but defending him against a a massive problem on his left when he picked her. Picked her. Plus, 
she's so unpopular. She's like, you know, she's like an insurance policy for him. I mean, there are Christian hardcore conservatives who are praying that Joe Biden stays healthy. Think about that for a little bit. That's actually a very fair point. Hey, thanks so much for watching The First on YouTube. If you liked what you saw, go ahead and like and subscribe. You heard me like it, subscribe. You'll get a lot more of it and a lot more of me.